Welcome to episode 116 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Once again, I'm joined by Mary, a woman who thinks that Butler's Ford is the name of the Uber she took home from the bar last night. I am merely a trampled dam named Darren. Howdy, Mary. What? Hello, 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 hello. Butler's Ford was the name of the Uber. I think it might have been. So you were stumbling wow. something last night. I don't know exactly what it was. What's last going on? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. It's a little warm for October here in New England, Mary. Not it's it's Halloween season. It's uh uh it, it should be cooler, but it's okay. It's gonna be cool in here soon. So you're, everything's going okay for you. Mood's okay. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? I'm bummed. nothing, nothing but nothing but good times here. I was nothing just going to make times. fun of you and say, like, when are you not bitching about the weather? Uh, I'm I'm definitely a weather bitchy type of guy. I'll you be are. the first to admit that. You are. Um, but since I am hosting tonight, I'm gonna I'm gonna do do the chores and ask you, of course, what are you drinking on this fine evening? Um, I'm drinking Bird of Prey from Vanished Valley, which is in Ludlow, Massachusetts. It's very good. Mm -hmm. And I totally bought that beer for us tonight, just completely based on the can art of the eagle. That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And I'm drinking it out of my Oliver Otis Howard mug, even though he is not part of this battle tonight. He was part of the battle that happens before it, which is Battle of Antietam. He is there. That is true. And that's that's one of his first battles that he comes back after he's been injured at uh seven pines mm-hmm. i've and heard of howard I've, I've heard of him yeah he's he seems to be we did an episode on him you probably forgot all about that speaking of forgetting all about it i'll i'll, I'll just tell you what i'm drinking you're probably not going to ask me but i i am drinking shockingly mary i know this is going to surprise you with the same thing you are because you bought the beer tonight this um, one with the eagle on it because um that's what we're doing and i'm drinking it out of my um, the, my Tudor Hall mug apparently. I didn't even check it. That's random. I, it, I didn't. There's nothing to apply to this one. So Tudor Hall, the home of John Wilkes Booth and family. Anyway, Mary. So this is good stuff. We're back recording again. We are, we are uh, just past. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Mary, but a couple of weeks ago uh, in the town of Sharpsburg, Maryland, they celebrated the 161st anniversary of the Battle of Antietam. Famously, the bloodiest day in American history. Yep. And, you know, just on September 17th of 1862, nearly 23,000 men um, or 4,000 more in the Tampa Bay Rays home playoff game last night, by the way, just saying. Yes, which is really they, sad. It, it, it is. But they became casualties in Sharpsburg, Maryland, which resulted in Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia falling back into Maryland at the hands of one George McClellan in his Army of the Potomac. Now, are you saying George McClellan did something positive? I don't. I don't know. I don't think that's a possible <laughs> thing. Depending what it is, right? I was just going <laughs> to say though, regarding this, regarding the Battle of Antietam, it's mm-hmm. a lot like what we say about Battle of Gettysburg. And yes, I know Battle of Gettysburg gets talked about a lot, but you know, there's a lot of people like you know, it's like you look at the Battle of Gettysburg and they're looking at just July first, second, third, and they're not consider. You know, there's before and after that happens that is the reason Mm -hmm. for the battle happening so battle of antietam it happens on september 17th 1862 but there's it happens before that with um the battle of south mountain which we've done an episode on and that's important but there's also the after of antietam lee's retreat and all that which nobody really talks about and it's a really important part of it and it actually puts mcclellan I think in a more positive light, when you look at it and a lot of people, when they study Antietam, they stop at that September 17th. They're like, that's where it ends. And it's, you need to look beyond that to see the rest of the Maryland campaign. I mean, right. You know, not a lot of study goes into Lee's retreat from Antietam. I mean, compared to his retreat from Gettysburg, to your point, but unlike the battle in Pennsylvania, this wasn't even supposed to be a retreat. It it was in, that's the thing is it goes, it's a very fascinating story, but but just, you know, after Antietam, it, it seemingly ended Lee's invasion of the North. And that popular belief, like you said, is that Lee retreated back to Winchester, Virginia, while McClellan sat back on his hindquarters and did nothing, yeah. thus missing a huge opportunity to bag Lee and possibly end the war. Now, and as usual with history, Mary, sometimes it is more perception than reality, because when you study Lee's exodus from, uh, from Maryland across the Potomac at Boltless Ford, near Shepherdstown, Virginia, now West Virginia, you'll see, to quote old Winfield Scott Hancock, mayor of Novi Gettysburg, it seems George McClellan was a little more involved than originally thought, right? Yes. And that's that's the thing. So 
you know, just after the firing ended on September 17th in Sharpsburg, after that long and bloody stalemate, you know, both armors remained on the field, you know, for the rest of the day. So, and it's interesting how, what happens in the next, next couple hours, because you're going to, you're going to see Lee's mindset change. He's going to change his mind a couple of times. And you're going to see how McClellan kind of, kind of looks forward, anticipates some of his moves. So the thing about it is, is, is when you, like, like I said, no one studies the post part of Antietam. They, no. they really don't for the most part. There's some great well, this books very about similar Antietam. With Get- like nobody really studies. Like, I mean, there's more people studying the post of Gettysburg now, thanks to Kent Masterson Brown's book and all that. But like, yeah. it's the same thing. It's like Gettysburg just doesn't just end on July the 3rd. Antietam does not end on uh, September the 17th. No, McClellan, you know, contrary to popular opinion, he has a plan to resume the fight the next day on September 18th, which is going to be led by the 6th Corps under the command of William B. Franklin. Mm -hmm. And he's going to launch an attack on Lee's left, supported by the 3rd Division of Andrew Humphrey's Pennsylvania men from Fitz John Corps to Smith Corps. Right, right. And so that's the thing. Humphrey's division, okay, is not on the battlefields during the Battle of Antietam. His division, which is full of all new people, by the way, they're still in Washington as late as September 14th. Mm-hmm. The Beltway traffic is brutal. Everybody knows that, and it, it and this affects them as well. During the night of the 17th, Humphreys is going to write Porter. And he's going to stay. He's going to say, listen, I'm still like 20 miles away, not for nothing, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to make it to Sharpsburg until dawn on the 18th. Well, that's the problem because that's the day McClellan originally wants to attack. So in yeah. the morning of the of September 18th, McClellan's waiting and he's writing letters himself now. He's going to sit back. He's going to write his infamous, my battle was a masterpiece of art. His That letter yeah, to, to his, his wife. wife. He's going to write on that day. Apparently he's still he, trying to impress her even though they're married. Oh yeah, he is. But he's also going to write a letter to General in Chief uh, Henry Halleck about the previous day's work. He's going to take a little bit of a victory lap. He's going to talk about what's going on. But here's the thing. His anticipated reinforcements, they did arrive on the 18th. Humphrey's division, as well as that 4th Corps under Darius Couch, who's at, he's, a, he's a single division corps, and they're going to march all night long, as Lionel Richie once said, Mary. And But they're in no shape to fight on the 18th. They get there early in the dawn. They've been up all night. And for this reason, McClellan on September 18th is going to basically say, well, we're going to wait a day. Let's yeah. rest the troops. Let's relax. And we're going to begin the shenanigans on the next day, on the 19th, when Franklin's attack that he originally planned, supported by Couch and supported by Humphreys, is going to proceed. That's the plan. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think that's a good call on McClellan's part because, I mean, he's recognizing that there's parts of the army that are very tired. And he also is, this is a risk for him. And McClellan is. Like, I mean, I like McClellan, but he's not a risk taker and risks are tough for him. And for him to just say like, yeah, go attack, even though you haven't had any sleep, that's a huge risk. And I think he's making the right call here by saying like, you know what? Just Well, I think he, he weighs the pluses and the minuses. Yeah, exactly. But on the other side, what's, what's Robert E. Lee doing? You know, he's also formulating a plan as well. He's going to call a council of war in, in on the 17th as well. Mm-hmm. Most of his subordinates are pretty pessimistic about about their chances. They're like, dude, where they're they're telling him that like their lines are like almost like skirmish lines where they are in the battlefields. Like they're 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 spread really thin because Lee asked them, okay, what is it like? How's your command? Like, how are your men? And they're like, it's thin. The lines are thin, and we need to rest. And they're like, we can't attack tomorrow. So they're telling him we're tired. They're tired. They're down about 30,000 men. They're yeah. beaten up. They're having, they're having a tough time. Many suggested, why don't we just retreat back to Virginia, call it a day, but Lee wasn't going to have it. As well, far as he's, what he's concerned. Done. Well, and this, this is the important thing about this, okay? Lee was not done. When Lee fell back, when he's going to fall back now, it was not to help to get the hell out of Dodge. He's gonna, we're going to talk about this in more detail in a little bit. But he, he saw this as a setback, and he's going to turn around and go right back. He's hell-bent to fight in the north and get it to Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. As far as he's concerned, like I said, the Maryland campaign was not over. His goals are not achieved, and he still had some energy ready to go. Lee is going to say in this council of war to his men, he's going to say, gentlemen, 
I can't do the Martin Sheen voice, but I'll, you can hear in your head as I talk, okay? <laughs> feel, feel free, okay? Gentlemen, we will not cross the Potomac tonight. You will go to your respective commands and strengthen your forces. If McClellan wants a fight in the morning, I will give battle again. And then he goes, and they stand there, and he goes, now go. He points and throws them all out of his office. Get the hell out of here. Go. That's what he does. Lee's not stupid, though. He knows his army is beat up and bruised, mm -hmm. and he knows, but, but for the most part, they're still on the field. Now, retreating, he, know, he knew retreating meant Union victory. So he's going to roll the dice to see what happens on the 18th. Let's see. I'll wake up on the 18th. Let's see what this deal is. Let's see what's going on. And let's decide what we're going to do based on what the situation is. He knows he knows McClellan's beaten up too, but mm -hmm. he doesn't want to leave the field. I'm not sure if he's trying to decide, well, maybe McClellan's going to leave, but whatever's going to happen. He's going to sit back and he's just going to wait. So he's going to go to sleep and he's going to wake up on the 18th and the sun's going to rise. It's going to be Thursday, September 18th. And both armies, they're tense. You can imagine. They're, they're wondering what's going on. They're the oh. big, the bloodiest day in American history the day before. Yeah. They don't know what the other side is going to do. Those feds, the feds, they got those reinforcements we talked about. Humphreys yeah. and Couch, they're, they're going to finally make it. But outside of a couple of a thousand stragglers, the Rebs get nobody. Yeah, They've got no reinforcements. They've got no help from Richmond that's going to be sent, right? So they get a couple of guys that fall back into the army who took off the day before. And Lee, for the most part, he knew at this point, a full federal attack, he was done. He, he knew that. But what, but, what he, but what he didn't know was that Mac wasn't ready to attack yet either. He surmised probably that he was beaten up as well. He didn't know that he was getting reinforcements for the most and, part. And a lot and quite a few reinforcements compared to just the stragglers that mm -hmm. you know that lee's get, that lee is getting but you know lee's done a lot in this maryland campaign so far like he's gone through maryland and he's captured harper's ferry along with twelve thousand federals but the other on the other side of it too you have mcclellan who has stopped lee at south mountain you know he stopped the confederate advance there and he's fought him at antietam at the very least he could very well force him to retreat so the two men are sitting in a position where it's it's really difficult for them both. And I think that's something that you need to consider yeah. when looking at this is like they're in a, they're both in a tough spot. They're right playing now. a game at they're playing a game of chicken for the most part. Yeah. And the one thing McClellan does not want, he knows he wants to act quick. He wanted to fight in the 18, but Humphreys and Couch weren't there. But he knows the longer it goes, the more likely Lee is going to seize the initiative again. And McClellan mm -hmm. wants to seize the initiative. He yep. wants to maintain it. So as the day goes on on the 18th um, and, and no battles coming, Lee basically had a moment of clarity. He sat back and said, well, you know what? Maybe it's best. You know, he kind of went back and forth this because he, he, he wanted he wanted to have Stonewall Jackson take 50 guns to go around the Union flank from the north and fight and hit hit them. But his generals were like, no, Stephen D. Lee's like, we can't. It, we just, we mm -hmm. just don't. Just don't. It's a bad idea, Gene, situation here. Don't do it. Yep. But Lee has a moment of clarity at this point. He says, well, maybe if we, if we recross the Potomac and we head back into Virginia, I don't want to retreat. I want to do what's called a retrograde. I want to fall back. I want to rest my army. I want to get everyone back together again. And then what I want to do is I want to move upstream to Williamsport, Maryland. And I want to cross the ford there and continue the attack. So I'm gonna, I'm thinking I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna cross the cross the, the ford, go back into Virginia, but I'm not gonna go back and call it a day. I'm gonna kind of rest my batteries, charge my phones, get everything ready to go, and then head to Williamsport and continue. So it's not a retreat, it's called a retrograde. That's what he wants to do. He wants to he wants to continue it. Now, and that's important to, that's important to remember because you know, I think historical memory says. AP Hill comes in from Harpers Ferry, Burnside Bridge happens. Uh, yeah. He stops Burnside. Lee takes off and goes. McClellan stays, and everyone goes back to their corners. And that's yeah. just not what happened, right? That, that's exactly, and that's exactly the thing. That's kind of the, I, I don't know if I want to call it an issue when you're looking at Antietam, but Antietam is kind of the battle that really is so negative when it comes to McClellan and all that. And and with the army of the Potomac. And it's like, it doesn't just end on the 17th. There's so much, there's more that happens that factors into it 
that really could, you know, kind of, I don't know, it, it will make people think differently, I think, about some of these figures in this and all that. But it does, it doesn't just end on the 17th. Lee doesn't just, you know, hightail right. it back, you know, south. And McClellan doesn't sit on his ass. Right. There's stuff going on. No, so so Lee makes the decision. I'm gonna, I'm gonna recross the Potomac. He's, I'm gonna regather my army, and we're gonna restart the campaign. Uh, so on the night of September 18th, Lee is gonna is gonna begin to withdraw his army to the same place he entered Maryland, which is called Boltler's Ford, also known as Blackford's Ford, also mm-hmm. known as Pack Horse Ford. This thing's got a lot of names, Mary. A also lot of known names. As okay. Shepherdstown. And it's just about a mile south of the town of Shepherdstown, Virginia. Okay, like we said, now it's West Virginia, but at the time it was Virginia, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, Boltler's Ford was a tremendously important place for Lee. It, it, a ford is a small rise of rocks and rivers, so you can walk across it. Lee did not have pontoons. He did not have boats. So he had to cross on this ford. This is the same ford that... Stonewall Jackson crossed on the 14th. Mm-hmm. This is the same ford, the same ford that uh, A.P. Hill crossed on the 17th. So he knew because the river was so deep around it, he had to maintain this ford. And so for the most part, he had, you know, he had to do it. Now, so on the night of the 18th, okay, Lee is going to order, is going to issue, issue his orders to his army to withdraw and cross Boatler's Ford back into Virginia. Again, not to retreat but to redeploy and start again. Just before leaving, Lee is going to write a letter to Jefferson Davis, Mary, the president of the Confederacy. You probably heard him, okay? Hmm. He's going to tell him that the campaign was not over, that he was planning to continue the 1862 campaign all the way into, into Pennsylvania as planned. Don't get excited. We're leaving. This is part of the deal. It's halftime. We're going back to our locker rooms. Then we're going to go. That's what he's going to do. Now, what's funny is, is they were leaving at night. So to make sure the army could get across, they lit a whole bunch of torches and fires. It looked like the scene like, like from Survivor, that, that TV show. That's what it looked like. To make sure there was enough light for the Confederacy to cross the ford because it was that important. So by 4 a.m. now on Friday, September 19th, most of Lee's army is going to be safely across the Potomac and uh, across the ford into Virginia. Now, soon later, okay, it's early in the morning now, yep. McClellan is going to wake up at his headquarters, and he's going to be ready to attack Lee on his right flank, just as he had planned the day before. But then what happens, he starts to get a bunch of text messages on the phone, Mary, hearing reports that Lee is gone, that yep. he vacated the dance floor. You know, Dude, where's my <laughs> general? He's gone, right? So McClellan should have called Miss Cleo. Well, he Miss, Miss Cleo would have would have been helpful in the situation. <laughs> but what he's going to do, though, contrary to popular belief, he doesn't sit back and say, "Well, oh well." He's going to send his cavalry to go because he knows he's got to cross at Bowlers. He knows that's where yeah. he's going to go. He's going to send them down to try to chase them down to try to chase down these retreating guys. This, of course, will be an Albert Pleasanton. Okay, now Pleasanton is. He's going to end up bagging 167 Confederate prisoners here Mm -hmm. uh, from the rear elements of Lee's army. And also what he's going to do is uh, uh, Pleasanton, he is going to place three batteries of the 2nd U.S. Horse Light Artillery on the banks of the Potomac on the the Maryland side as well. McClellan, and this is this is the thing about McClellan that people don't really study about this, is he's yeah. he's thinking, he's moving the chess pieces he around. He, he's going to begin to spread out his infantry to yeah. different places to prevent Lee from coming back. He knows, or he thinks anyway, that Lee's not gone, that Lee's yeah. taken a break. So I need to make sure that he does not cross back across the, the, the Potomac yeah. again. So what's McClellan going to do? He's going to send the 12th Corps now commanded by the Alpheus Williams Mary to go to Harpers Ferry to yep. keep the Rebs from reacquiring that town. And most important, we're going to talk more about this detail later. He's going to send Franklin's Sixth Corps, who was supposed to attack that morning, as well as half of his cavalry to Williamsport, Maryland, to guard the ford there. Because he yep. knows that if, if Lee's going to cross again, he's crossing there. And he, he correctly guesses. I don't want to give away the story. But this is going to prove to be a stroke of genius by McClellan to do this. Yeah. It really, really is. He's also going to send the Fifth Corps under Fitz John Porter, and he's going to send him to follow Pleasanton 
to Boltler's four to try to, and this is this is where the rest of the story takes place now. Yeah. Is what happens now as the Union goes to chase down Lee Cross and Boltler's Ford. Yeah, and that's so Pleasanton is on his way there uh, to Boltler's Ford, um, and then when the first of the Fifth Corps reaches the Potomac River, they find the rear of the Confederate army there, and they're going to attack the rear guard, which is commanded by General William Pendleton, and this fight breaks out between them. And Pendleton, he does have some good terrain on the Virginia side of the Potomac. Um, he places 600 men there. They're from the brigades of General Alexander Lawton and General Lou Armistead, but both those guys have been wounded, so they're not actually there for this because they've both been wounded at Antietam. Um, okay. And they have 33 cannons that are going to cover the Ford. And Lee has given Pendleton two orders. The first, if the Union just fires artillery... Pendleton was to withdraw on September 20th. If the Union makes a major attack, he's to fall back on the evening of September 19th. So Lee knows that he doesn't have the forces in Pendleton to cover a major attack. And he just is like, if they're going to attack you full force with the infantry and all that, you just need to vacate the dance floor and get back. Yeah, he puts Pendleton in charge of this really important thing. And he knows this. Now, William Pendleton... We've talked about him a little bit, not too too mm-hmm. much. He's fifty. He's fifty two years old. Fifty two years old at this point. He was born in Richmond, Virginia. Graduated fifth out of forty two cadets in his West Point class of eighteen thirty. Um, he's an interesting fellow, Mary. Eighteen thirty three. He's going to leave the military and become a teacher, uh, and he's going to join the Episcopal ministry and become ordained in eighteen thirty eight. Now he's an interesting fellow. Like I said, eighteen fifty three. Now. Pendleton is going to become the rector of the Grace Church in Lexington, Virginia. It's a role he'll hold for the rest of his life through, throughout the war and afterwards. When the war starts, he's going to be elected captain of the Rockbridge Artillery, and eventually he'll become the commander of the Confederate Artillery under Joseph E. Johnson on March 26th of 1862. Now, he's a, he's a fun study. You know, when he first got that Rockbridge artillery gig, he stole those four cannons from VMI. He called them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Oh, that's and, right, too. Know, yes. Which are saints. <laughs> yeah. And we were talking about this earlier when I told yeah. you this. You originally thought they were the name of the Backstreet Boys. And I said, no, they're saints. What? And it was kind of awkward. But that's what he did. He That's how we got, how he named them. He's oh, a religious, he's a religious guy. That's 100% that's true. Now, like many in the army, though, right? religion guided his actions we you know start about stonewall and you talk about you know pope and all these other guys howard. but oh god yes howard okay but <laughs> artillery is heavily reliant on logistics and mathematics to be successful okay since mathematics is perfect it just is pendleton felt that math was a direct gift from god and so he thus earned the nickname the Par- parson pendleton so he felt measuring wow. our, t- our t- trigonometry and all that stuff. That was a gift from God because it was perfect, just, just like God was. That's how he saw it, right? Now, real quick, by the way, after the war, you know, he's going to be the one who persuades Robert E. Lee to take the job at Washington University to be the president. And he's also going to be the guy when Lee dies who conducts his funeral in the last wow. So he so he's 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 close with Lee all mm-hmm. the way through from, from soup to nuts with this thing, right? So Back in Bowers Ford now, Lee is going to tell Pendleton, you know, to hold it and keep the Federals on the Maryland side, just like you said. Lee is going to give him 10 batteries of Confederate reserve artillery. It, it's 33 guns. It's actually 44, but he keeps 11 in the back. So it's 33, but he had actually had 44 guns, as well as two brigades of rebel infantry. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to give you two brigades of infantry. Sounds pretty good. Here's the problem. After Antietam, the two brigades only number 600 guys. Yeah. They're beaten up. So there's not as many. So one of the brigades is commanded by John Lamar, who for the most part, these are all Georgians now. And he's going to take over for a guy named Marcellus Douglas, who was killed at Antietam. Mm-hmm. So this, his brigade was made up of the 13th, 26th, 31st, 6th, 38th, 60th, and 61st Georgia. Okay, The other one was commanded by James Hodges. From Richard Anderson's division, these Virginians now made up of the 9th, 14th, 38th, 53rd, and 57th Virginia. And as you mentioned, their commander, Louis Armistead, yeah. he was wounded, and he ends up being assigned by Lee to be a provost guard, just to keep him in the back. That, but, yeah. but that's who we're dealing with. So you're talking about all these regiments 
but you're talking 600 guys. You're not talking about a lot. It sounds a lot yeah, more. Yeah, it's, it's not a lot. And as we're going to talk about later, these guys are going to get spread really thin. They are. Pendleton's going to, like I said before, they're going to split those guns up. 15 are going to go uh, right below the Ford. Uh, he's going to have 18 above the cliffs. And then 11, like I said, are going to be held back. So, and then he's going to also tell his guys, conserve ammo as much as you can. We ain't got yeah. a lot. Of it, so conserve. Now, here's the thing about the terrain. Now, you and I have been to have been to Shepherdstown. We've been to the battlefield. Yeah. Once you Bro, cross the river. Is that where river, we cross the barbed wire fence? Yeah, we, we jumped the fence. That was like, one of, the, one that of was our good. Like, The private our property? Adventures. That was really good. So, once you get away from the river, it is that road that was there then. It's still there now. Yep. But beyond that, the, the terrain gets really crazy. There are cliffs. There are real high rises. I mean, they're literally rock cliffs. If yep. you go there and you see it, there's obviously they're still there. And, and so the so the terrain is very difficult. Pemble, uh, Pemberton's Union Cavalry now is, you know, he has and he has five artillery battalions that are going to take position on the bluffs of, across the ford on the Maryland side. And what you, like you said a little while ago, it's going to begin a heavy artillery barrage back and forth. It's going to go on for a while. Yeah. Right. And during this whole thing, here comes Fitz John Poor's fifth corps, and they're going to start to arrive. For the most part, these guys didn't see a lot of action in Tito. They, they no. didn't. So they're, they're fresh and they're, they're ready to go. They're also going to have the first United States sharpshooters under Captain John Eisler, as well as a second company. Of the second Massachusetts sharpshooters, known as the second Andrew sharpshooters, under a guy named General Lewis Wentworth. Okay, they're going to line up on the river bank and they're going to start sniping. They're going to start taking shots at the Confederates to do the best they can. You mentioned before, you know, Pendleton has got a couple choices what to do here. Hmm. He's doing okay at this point. He's hanging in there. Pendleton, despite telling his men to conserve the ammo, they didn't really listen and they started to run out and they started to lose it. Yep. Matter of fact, some rebel batteries had no no ammo at all. They just stood around, hanging yeah. on left. And, and I nothing. think that's really telling of the state that Lee's army is in, leaving Antietam mm -hmm. as well, which is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. So he's very, like, it's not good for the Army of Northern Virginia. And I think this the whole, like, conserve your ammo, you know, yeah. conserve, the, conserve the artillery is very telling of the state of the Army of Northern Virginia yeah. at this point, too. So when when, when Fitzjohn Porter starts to see the, the gun slackening a little bit, he's going to order the 4th Michigan under uh, Colonel Jonathan Childs, as well mm -hmm. as Cleveland Winslow's 5th New York and John Marsh's 10th New York. And these are from Governor K. Warren's brigade from, to the Ford. They're going to start mm -hmm. sending the guys down towards the Ford. So Pendleton knows if I'm pressed, I need to back off. So now we're late on the 19th, Pendleton, he doesn't know they're coming yet. He starts to notice the Union artillery, while his artillery is slowing down, the Union is getting faster, mm -hmm. right? And what does that tell him? He knows that that means infantry is coming. They're protecting yeah. the infantry coming now. This, this is a, this is their shield to let the infantry cross. So he knows he's in for it now. He knows he's screwed, right? And he's right. Because Porter's men, those men, the ones I mentioned, are preparing to cross Boatler's Ford into Virginia to go chase down Lee. And then Pendleton, we mentioned before, he's only got 600 guys and many of his guns are out of ammo. So he decided he couldn't do it anymore. So he decides to GTFO. OK, yep. now when I mean that, I mean, he decides to take. Oh, he, he personally he, goes. He, he goes. He doesn't he doesn't say roll him up, he's lock not, him up, boys. We're he going. He tell turns and goes. He's just like, bye. OK, he puts on his all of Rodas Howard shirt and runs. What? He goes right. And he leaves his guys in their position, okay? As he hauls ass, men of the 4th Michigan in those first United States sharpshooters, they're going to start to cross Boltler's Ford. Yeah. The funny part about the Michigan men, they couldn't find the Ford. So they decided to try to jump in the water. And like a Michigan team on a bowl game in January, they fall on their face completely. <laughs> so they fall in the water. It goes up to their, up to their chins, their guns, and their, and their ammo packs – all get wet and they can't go anymore. Oh, but the U.S. sharpshooters, they make it. They actually get across. And the first sharpshooters, when they get across, they make it across. They're, they make it across. They're dry. They're safe. And when they get there, they notice that most of the ribs are starting to fall back and they're gone too. 
They captured four artillery pieces, but the remaining 40 are all safely removed back. So they got four of them. Now, what's funny about these four, Charles Griffin, right? He commanded the 2nd Brigade under, under Charles Morrill's division of the 5th Corps. Yeah. He was one of the guns they captured. He recognized the gun. He was the key. Turns out that he was one of those guns was one of the ones that he personally lost at the Battle of First Bull Run. When he, was commanding the, when he was commanding the West Point oh my God. Battery, he was a captain. He saw the gun and goes, hey, that's my gun. And he was like, woohoo, I got my gun back. So he was so Griffin was able to get his gun back. That's cr- I wonder how many times that happened in the Civil War because there was probably a constant exchange of like, "Hey, this used to be ours. Give it back." Yeah. He, so I don't know how he recognized it, but he recognized the gun. He well, there would be like a mark on it, probably. Yeah. And so he was all excited to get his gun back because he lost it. He lost it. He was part of the West Point artillery. I mean, the battery. So he was, as you can imagine, he was pretty escape. He was pretty happy. So during this rebel escape, you know, Pendleton now, you know, he was. He was, it was nighttime and he's basically looking for someone in high command. He's running in the woods in the dark, doesn't know what the hell he's going. He's looking for James Longstreet for whatever reason. He's looking for Longstreet, but he can't find him. It's too dark. By happenstance, he happens to stumble onto the headquarters of one Robert E. Lee just before midnight on the 19th. He somehow finds Lee's headquarters. What's Robert E. Lee doing? He's asleep under an apple tree, just sleeping. Okay, wow. catch, catching it. And he's awakened by pen by, by penalty, freaking out. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, guess what happened? You know, it's like when your kid wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, dude, yeah. guess what? You know, and so he tells him all about the attack of Butler's Ford. And since Pendleton ran off, he doesn't know what happened. So what does he start doing? He tells Lee. I hate to tell you, Bobby, I lost the entire reserve artillery, all 44 guns. They're friggin' gone. And Lee, Lee says, and I quote. Lee's like, okay, good. He, he says, all of them? And Pendleton says, yes, General, I fear all of them. He only lost four, but he thinks he lost all of them because he took off so early. Well, he ran into some guy named Roger Pryor, who will become the law partner of Benjamin Butler after the war. But mm-hmm. the dude's a Confederate guy at this time. And Pendleton's like, so can you go rescue those cannons? And Pryor's like, nope, I can't. And that's when Pendleton's like, all right, I'm done. So you can just imagine your job. If you get pressed, get the hell out. I'm going to give the entire reserve artillery in two brigades. Yeah. Okay, fine. I come back. You're, you're asleep under the apple tree. Hey, guess what? All the guns are gone. Sorry. I mean, that's, that's what he basically does. Right. So Lee probably sighed and said, Oh God, but, but he's, he tells Pendleton, he goes, listen, nothing could, can be done about it right now get to bed we'll i'm gonna we'll wake up in the morning we'll come up with a game plan we'll figure this whole thing out just don't sweat it okay one person who found out about this who was not cool about it was thomas stonewall jackson yeah he was pretty not. pissed off yes. so he was livid at losing all the guns and he didn't want to wait till morning so what does he do he's going to stay up all night long he's going to come up with a game plan he's going to put three divisions together to march back to Bowler's Ford, and by 6.30 in the morning, on the 20th, he had sent A.P. Hill's re- entire reserve division now ahead to the Ford with Stonewall Jackson riding in the front, ahead of the column, all by himself, way ahead to reconnoiter the area. He's he's the cavalry. Because that's so, safe. so is this where right, he but, starts, like, getting the karma, and then he cashes it in? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but here's the thing. <laughs> The alarm clock goes off. Robert Lee wakes up and goes, where did my army go? <laughs> Jackson never told Lee he was taking him. He just oh did it on his God. own. He, he, could, he In a full YOLO moment, he took A.P. Hill's division to Boltler's Ford to get the guns. Never told Lee. And Lee wakes up and, and, and good percentage of his army has gone. He's like, all right, well. Now, while this is all going on on the Union side, McClellan, you know, he had a plan of his own. To set on the 20th as well. And late mm-hmm. on the 19th, probably around the same time Pendleton was stumbling and eaten to Robert E. Lee's camp, he's going to go and he's going to basically um, write to Fitz John Porter, the fifth, his fifth corps commander. And this is a quote from, from McClellan. Now, I want you to remember the narrative that McClellan didn't do anything after Antietam. Okay? Oh, I know now, it this, very well. Okay. This is the quote. He, this is literally what he writes to Fitz John Porter. 
He goes, push your command forward after the enemy as rapidly as possible, using your artillery upon them wherever an opportunity presents, doing to them all the damage in your power without incurring too much risk to your command. If great results can be obtained, do not spare your men nor your horses. He tells him to push all the chips in and friggin' go for it. Yeah, that sounds like a guy that's sitting on his ass in Antino. Yeah, but that, but that's the that's the narrative. I know, but no, no, but that's what I'm, I'm just being sarcastic. There's like that. Yeah. yeah, he's being very. He's like, do it, get it done. Yeah, he he wa- he wants he wants to attack. Yeah. So by dawn on the twentieth, Charles Griffin's second brigade. He's all excited. He's got his gun back. He is going to basically, you know, he's replaced by Charles Lovell, his brigade of U.S. regulars, the 1st, 2nd, 6th, 10th, and 11th, and the 17th United States. The regulars, these are the men who chose the Army as their profession. These are not volunteers. Mm -hmm. These are the regulars, okay? They're going to be joined by the 1st Brigade under James Barnes, okay, from George Morrell's 1st Division of the 5th Corps. So in total, McClellan is going to send 3,000 troops across the Potomac, and to do so, He's going to do what's going to, he's not going to a full attack at this point. What he wants to do is what's called a reconnaissance and force. Okay. What he wants to do is he wants to send those 3,000 men in and he wants to make contact with the enemy to reconnoiter their strength and numbers and then fall back to report their findings. It's similar to what Buford and Reynolds were supposed to do at Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. They were supposed to go find the enemy with a yeah. big, strong force and then fall back. There's a problem, though, Mary. There's always, there's always a problem, okay? Normally, when you do a reconnaissance in force, your cavalry leads you. They're yeah. at the vanguard, okay? I mentioned before, McClellan had already sent half of his cavalry to Williamsport. So half of them were already gone. Mm-hmm. The other half are seven miles away in the town of Keatesville, Maryland, getting refitted. So he ain't got no horses, okay? He has no, no, no horses. Ho- he ain't got the horses, okay? So this recon of force was going to be done by infantry alone, which is going to lead to some issues. Now, the regulars, they're going to get moving. They're going to get within about one mile from the Ford. And I mentioned before, Stonewall Jackson's recon, he's going to be up there, and Stonewall is going to spot them. And he's going to ride back to A.P. Hill's division and immediately deploy his division into two lines. He knows he's got Union in front of him. And so he's going to deploy in a battle line. Up front, he's going to have Dorsey Penders, North Carolinians. In the middle, he's going to have that fun-loving Maxie Gregg and his South Carolinians. Oh, Maxie and, Gregg. And, and he's also on the right kind of a guy named Edward Thomas. No one ever knows Edward Thomas, but Edward Thomas is there, too. He's on the right-hand side. On the second line, he has John Brock and Bros, Virginians, then James Lane's North Carolinians, and then James Archer's Brigade, which is Alabamians, Georgians, and Tennesseans. Okay, Tennesseans? That was- I, Tennesseans, yep. I think I think that's what it is. I but was that's say what there's had. Georgians here. Apparently, there are. They're not all in Gettysburg. There's there, there, there's some here too. But but that's so he's got two solid lines, and it wasn't long until those U.S. regulars run into the you know the oncoming division of A.P. Hill, and again they begin to fall back because that's their orders: go mm-hmm. meet the enemy, see the numbers, and then start to fall back. When Hill's men got within range of artillery placed on the Maryland side of the Potomac. We mentioned before that Pleasanton set up the guns on, on, on the river there. They started firing. Boom, 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 boom. And Hill's men got pounded. They just they just got, they just got drilled, mm-hmm. right? A member of the 18th North Carolina about this artillery barrage, he's going to write, the shell fire was so accurate that they'd hit a litter carrying off our wounded or our canteen men going across the ridge in our rear for water. So what is he saying? He's saying that the, the guns are accurate and they're 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 deadly. Yeah. That they've got they've got the field pretty much pinned down. Some of these U.S. regulars and some of Barnes' men, uh, they're actually going to be killed by this friendly fire because the lines are going to be so close. The artillery is wow. just going to fall on them. And as you can imagine, now here's the here's the thing. Okay, and, and when you talk about this battle which is going to be going to be called the Battle of Shepherdstown. The, the, what you hear about is the 118th Pennsylvania, okay? Now, when, when within Barnes Brigade was a regiment of green Pennsylvanians from Philadelphia called the 118th Pennsylvania, commanded by a guy named Charles Prevost. Because they were new, 
they were a huge regiment, over 730 guys in this regiment alone. Okay. Now, the, many of their rifles, these Enfields, had never been fired. I don't mean in battle. I mean fired yeah. at all. Oh they just God. weren't fired. Okay. So when the 118 Pennsylvania, they get to see this elephant for the first time, many lower their Enfields, they pulled the trigger, and guess what happened? Nothing happened. The guns are friggin' yep. defective. Okay. Oh, the guns are defective. <laughs> that's annoying. So when, the, when the hammer fell, it didn't hit didn't hit hard enough to hit the percussion cap to fire up the gun and shoot shoot the mini ball. So just imagine what's going through their minds. There were, there were stories of guys pounding the guns with rocks, trying to get the stupid thing to fire. A lot of the guys who were brand new, they didn't know that it wasn't firing. They assumed it was. They click and reload and keep loading. They just didn't realize they weren't firing. That's that's what these guys were doing. And Porter, Fitz John Porter, he he's surprised at how aggressive this rebel counterattack is. He's surprised. Mm-hmm. He did he didn't expect it, seeing all these men falling back. And he's going to say, you know what? We're doing a recon force Done. anyway. Let's just get the hell out of here. So he, he so basically he's he, he he's going to basically order that now. A private named Daniel Webster Burke. He's in the Second U.S. Regulars. Okay. Yeah. Um. And this is his a good story too. You know, he's crossing back, and while he's going across the river, right before he gets there, he finds a, an abandoned Rebel cannon. He does, and he walks by and goes, "Huh, cannon." He crosses the ford and says, hey, um, I don't know if you know this, but I saw a cannon. Can I go back and get it? Now, this is while fire is yeah. going around. He's like, eh, I'm going to go back and get it. He does, and he gets it back safely. And for that, he's, Private Burke is going to be awarded the Medal of Honor for this. Yeah, it's which is cool pretty story. cool. Yeah. yeah. One regiment seeing action for the first time in this battle would be the 20th Maine Mary, led by one Adele Bart Ames. <gasps> Not Ames. Ames, well... He's coming. Aim second in command, <laughs> a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He oh, he's is, only a he's, colonel? He's a lieutenant colonel. He's <laughs> on his horse riding up and down the ford, directing the reinforcements to where to go. And his horse is going to be shot, and he's going to get thrown off of his horse oh, into geez. the water. And he's going to have to dig himself up. He's going to be all covered in mud. He's going to climb up, up the, back up the ford again. Uh, but he's going to be unharmed. So there you go. So so he's, he's saved. The men of the 20th Maine actually performed pretty well. They only had three casualties, including one guy who shot himself with his own musket somehow. That was what? one of the casualties. I don't know. I have boys we boys. But Barnes, for the most part, he's going he's gonna to order everyone back. He's going to close the umbrella. Everyone back. Let's get out of here. Okay. Now, there's going to be a problem with communication. And this communication problem is going to affect that green regiment I mentioned, the 118 Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And they are going to pay a heavy price for this. The men of the 118th, they're going to be known as the Corn Exchange Regiment, okay? Yeah. Because the Corn Exchange Association in Philly basically gave them $10 a bounty for each soldier, including the overall funds to raise the regiment. Remember I mentioned those cliffs that were, that were overlooking the Potomac? They're going to be basically on top of the cliff. So they're... It's a great position if you're attacking, but defense, you can only go far, so far back and there's a cliff and you're going to fall down. Yeah. They're on they're on that cliff. A courier is going to bring the orders to them to fall back. We're, out, we're all taken off. Let's get the hell out of here. Okay. We're going back into Maryland. The communication issue, the communication rather, was, was delivered by a line officer uh, to a line officer. It wasn't given to prevost. So they couldn't find us and here's your orders. It was a line officer and not the colonel. So when the officer who got the orders to retreat goes and finds Prevost, Prevost reads the order and ignores it. And he says, I do not receive orders this way. So basically, wow. if uh, he says, if Colonel Barnes had, if, uh, if he had General Barnes had any message to give me, let his aid come to me. So he pulls the whole the alpha dog thing and says, I didn't get the order directly. I'm not honoring mm-hmm. it. I'm staying here. And remember, these are the dudes with the defective guns. They put toy guns and keppies, you know, and toy swords fighting on this, on the, on this, this battle line. Right. <laughs> and with the, with the revs bearing down many of the 118th, you know, they're, they're looking for fallen rifles that you know, dead guys, anything to, to try to defend themselves. Finally, guess what happens? Colonel Prevost, he gets himself shot in the shoulder oh, and he geez. goes down. 
and the regiment is going to be taken over by Lieutenant Colonel James Gwynn, who had no problem accepting, accepting the offer. He would have taken the order out of a fortune cookie at this point. I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> He's like, I don't need about protocol. This is the order. Good for me. Let's go. Right. Oh my God. So Gwynn issues special order GTFO for the Pennsylvania, <laughs> the 118th Pennsylvania. But they try to they have got this cliff to deal with. So they're trying to climb down the cliff. They're trying to get down this hill. They're having a real tough time. Meanwhile, the revs are firing at them, shooting at their backs, knocking them down as you're trying to escape. Um, it, if, you, if you go to the Shepherdstown battlefield, there's an old cement factory that the remains, the ruins are still there. Some of these 118th, these Philly guys, are going to hide behind this old cement factory near the, near the river for shelter. Um, and so they're just trying to save their skin at this point. Many of the 118th, they jump into the Potomac and try to swim across it because they couldn't find the ford under fire as mm -hmm. the bullets are raining down. You can just imagine these, these poor, yeah. these are all green guys. Lieutenant J. Rudhall White, he makes it, this is kind of a bummer story. He makes it across and he, he gets across and he stops once he crosses the ford on the Maryland side to thank God for protecting him through this battle and just yeah. letting him live. The second he stops praying, he shot and killed. Oh dropped. my God. And so uh, by, by a mini ball from a Confederate from across the river. So um, by now it's like two o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. on September 20th. And what was going to be known as the battle of Shepherdstown is starting to wind down. Not a big battle, but it's an important battle. It is. That, yep. that one eighteenth we mentioned, they started with 737 men. Like I mentioned um, by 2 p.m., they lost 269 guys. They lost a ton of guys. The Union lost 361 at this battle. Most of them, 269, are from the 118th Pennsylvania. Yeah. So the 118th paid the price for this because of, a, because of an arrogant colonel who actually later on got promoted to Brigadier General. I don't know how that – and it, nice. he probably – actually, he probably didn't get court-martialed because he got injured, kind of like yeah. Sickles. I bet you that's why. I bet you that's why he didn't, right? Many of the Pennsylvania men – Never forgave Colonel Provost for this because he because mm -hmm. for you know Prevost rather um, because his stubbornness literally led to deaths. And as this is going on, AP Hill he basically decides to kind of call off the dogs at this point. He realizes that most of the Union guys are across the river now. His division lost just two hundred ninety one guys, not a lot of men. But he's like, you know what? I push the guys off. I'm I'm done. I'm done. And, but A.P. Hill, I mean, he's, he, he, you know, people don't talk about the Battle of Shepherdstown as big bloodletting no. like Antietam or Franklin or Gettysburg. No. But A.P. Hill, he writes, he writes, you know, he doesn't survive the war, but he writes after the battle, he writes of Shepherdstown. It was the most terrible slaughter that this war has, has yet witnessed. The broad surface of the Potomac was blue with the floating bodies of our foe. So you can just, just, just imagine yeah, how that must have been, right? Yeah. And it's something that does not get talked about when, you know, you know, when you think of Antietam, you just think, oh, it's just September 17th. But there's so much more to the Maryland campaign, just like there's so much more to a lot of these campaigns, to the Gettysburg campaign, to the Chickamauga campaign. Right. All of them. There's so much more that goes into them than just these uh -huh. battles. So you have to sometimes look beyond, you know, for Antietam, you have to look beyond September 17th to see more of what's going on because if yeah. you do you'll see that mcclellan is he's thinking and he's like how can how can i get lee he recognizes what he has to do so when september 17th rolls around or the end of it um so when the end of the battle in Tetum happens mcclellan does not go to his tent and sit on his ass for the next month as some historians would have us to believe he is doing stuff immediately afterwards he has to he's the commander of the army of the potomac he has to do stuff he has to be saying he's meeting with his general saying what can we do what do we what can we do in this case and he's planning and this is why you have shepherdston this is why you have lee being stopped from coming over at williamsport and that's the other part of this is that lee does not get across at williamsport to come back into maryland and to come into pennsylvania no, I mean, the Battle of Shepherdstown is over, but for Lee, the Maryland campaign, it's not. We said this earlier. 
And Lee wasn't planning on retreating back to Virginia after Antietam. He was retro retrograding. And his plan is to move up the stream to Williamsport mm -hmm. and continue. Like we saw this a million times now. But for that reason, we mentioned before, this is this is why Lee doesn't have cavalry. He's going to send Jeb Stewart to secure that landing and build bridges in preparation for the Army of Northern Virginia's arrival. So that's where, where Jeb is, right? Now, remember when I said McClellan had sent half of his cavalry to Williamsport? You, you yeah, that's what I mentioned. That. It's like he's sending right. some of his guys to Williamsport for that reason because he's trying – he's – predicting what Lee is going to do. Right. He did it because he anticipated Lee would try to cross there. And not only did he send half of his cavalry, he also sent the 6th Corps to infantry yep. to block him. Max blocking of Williamsport, the crossing completely foiled Lee's plan because he anticipated this maneuver and he gets zero credit for it. He doesn't. Yep. As a matter of fact, most people probably don't even know, didn't even know he did it. But McClellan's foresight in doing this was brilliant. Yep. Even Miss Cleo didn't even know he was going to do this. <laughs> I mean, again, but, that, the, she, but that's why I'm and, saying. Sorry, go ahead. Wasn't and, and, and you know he McClellan he had he had this foresight. You yep. know, he defends at Harpers Ferry, but he 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 surmised that Lee could continue, and he did. When Lee learned that McClellan had blocked Williamsport. He had no choice now but to call it quits and cancel the rest of the Maryland campaign of 1862, which is going to officially come to an end. The Battle of Shepherdstown is this last great battle, but it was Williamsport is where the Maryland campaign ended. And this is because of McClellan's foresight. Lee had, was forced to fall back initially to Martinsburg, Virginia, and then to venture to Win Winchester, Virginia, where he's going to rest and grow his army. On September 22nd, 1862, Lee has 34,618 men left. That's all he has. Many without shoes, without blankets, had to go through the woods. There's probably a Rosewoods clown situation going back. <laughs> but these guys, these guys were in a bad shape. Lee is going to use his time in Winchester to rest and recruit. By the time he's ready to go again, he's got the army back up to 60,000 guys, which is going to bend, eventually be the Gettysburg campaign. So he yeah. uses his time wisely. McClellan moved to retake Harper's Ferry, like we said, and he was waiting for supplies from Washington seemingly forever before he could do anything again. This is when yeah. Lincoln shows up and says, what are you doing? And let's, go, let's take a picture of the yeah. tents and hang out. And that meanwhile, whole... like Meade is writing back to his wife, we don't have supplies. So it's not just McClellan saying we don't have supplies. General Meade is writing to his wife saying we don't have supplies. Other soldiers mm -hmm. are saying we're not getting the supplies we need to pursue Lee. Right. But, you know, also remember that McClellan has done that the day, you know, a couple of days after Antietam. He does have a plan. He's yeah. very, mm -hmm. he's like, this is what we need to do. But, you know, McClellan and Lee after Antietam are both in a difficult position with their armies they're both very broken uh -huh. but i like you know mcclellan he is like well i'm gonna do what i need to do with it right and he does it like he yeah, after one that. guy one guy on the confederate side who if you read his book manassas Appomattox, is james yeah. longstreet he speaks a lot about this post antietam and he's gonna write about this he's about the maryland campaign this is what he says he says the Federals had their organization in hand and were better fed, better clothed, and better prepared. He's saying McClellan's arm was better prepared than Lee's at this point. He was. And he mm -hmm. goes on. But wait, there's more. He goes on. He says, he may say the Battle of Shepherdstown, that the Confederacy foiled every attack, yet the Federal commander McClellan scored a success that was startling. So he, they surprised him. And he mm -hmm. finished off by, by giving a great what if of his own, like we like to say. Longstreet, he's going to say of the overall Maryland campaign that if they'd won that battle, this is Antietam now, it would have denied Lincoln his Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. And then he says in his, his quote now, the Southern president would be in Maryland at the head of his army with a manifesto for peace and independence. That's what that's what he says about it. Wow. And, and so he um he talks about the importance of it, the importance of it. And I think most people realize Antietam is important, 
But I think they lose sight of the fact that Antietam is just a major battle in the Maryland campaign. It doesn't mm. end at Antietam. It, it doesn't. doesn't even end at Shepherdstown. It no. ends at Williamsport. And that's yeah. important to understand how and it doesn't was. Lee write about that? Doesn't he say something about McClellan regarding that? He, 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 he considered McClellan the best army general he fought against. I mean, who, who, I mean, who knows what the mindset of these people are? But it's but you know people you know McClellan he, he, he's going to obviously get replaced by Burnside yeah. the history is going to go on, but the, McClellan he's an interesting guy though you know one more story about this one you know May thirtieth eighteen eighty five George McClellan is going to return to Sharpsburg, which is going to be the only time he'll visit the Antietam battlefield after the war he's going to go back and visit it. One of his his guests is going to be one of Stonewall Jackson's officers, a guy named Henry oh. Kidd Douglas, is going to be his like buddy. Oh, we found guest. his grave. Right. That was we our did. big he's, grave he's, hunt he's, one he's day. He's buried in Shepherdstown, right? Kid Douglas is is going to host him for his gift, uh, guest for dinner, and they're going to tour the battlefield together. Douglas, he has a fantastic book called I Row with Stonewall. If you haven't read yeah. that book, I would read it because it's a fantastic insight. He's a guy who allegedly lost for Order 191. I mean, Henry Kid Douglas is, is an interesting guy. Uh, he's supposed to be the most attractive guy in the Confederacy, by the way. You, 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 you figure that one out and judge that one mm-hmm. on your own. But anyway, so they're going to be buddies and they're going to hang out and visit this battlefield. McClellan is, this is back in May, around May 30th, June 1st, 1885. Mac is going to go to the Antietam National Cemetery and he's going to be visited with several former Confederate and Union veterans. And he told the veterans that if he lost the Battle of Antietam, he was convinced he would have been tried and shot by Lincoln. That's what he told them. I don't his, agree. And so a lot of the men, um, they, they, and they're just a, these guys sitting around joking probably. He also joked that the reason why he fought so hard was because of how hard A.P. Hill fought against him. And he says, according to McClellan, it was because of a woman named Miss Nellie Marcy, a woman they both <laughs> dated at West Point, and McClellan eventually married. McClellan tells this story. And a Union veteran says to him, out of, out of the crowd, he yells up to him, you should have let Hill marry Miss Nellie, and he never would have fought so hard against us then. And Mac apparently smiled and laughed, and he says, and I quote, surely no one could have married a more gallant soldier than A.P. Hill. That's what he said. Mm. And what's funny is Douglas <laughs> invites Mac to come back later on. Come back if it's the bad when you got more time. But sadly, McClellan's going to die October 29, 1885. Yeah. So he's never going to make it back. But McClellan comes back, has a fun story with the Confederates and the Unions with Henry Kidd Douglas. And he tells a story about, about Miss Nellie, about Marcy. So, so we've talked about that a lot before. That's a great one because we talked about the spite Mars. Right. Why AP Hill comes to comes to Antietam because you know he Burnside owes him money he's pissed off at Stonewall Jackson and McClellan stole his girl yeah and so he talks about it he he confirms and he says yeah he confirms he, that's he, one reason why and the union guy goes well maybe you should have let him have her though you would have fought so hard against us you know? so it's it's interesting it's interesting but I, I think it's an interesting way to look at this because like we started this the perception is and Tatum happens, they fall back. But there's a lot that takes place between September yes. 17th and September 22nd, ultimately. And discover for yourselves, if you're listening to this, read about the retreat from, from Lee, read about the Battle of Shepherdstown, read about Williamsport, about how, you know, how the Sixth Corps and the cavalry is going to deny Lee and force him to fall back. And maybe it'll be a little different narrative as you read this stuff. Because I think when you read these stories and you read the original, the actual, the documents, the, the long streets, the Kid Douglas's stories, a lot of the stuff they talk about, it maybe helps present a different narrative that I think a lot of people think. And like I said, don't just read, question what you read, and read as much as you can about these subjects. Because I think if you do, you might come with a little more appreciation from the people history says sat on their asses and did nothing. Because obviously they didn't and that's what's great about these stories i would completely agree with you it's kind of like being a detect a detective you have to constantly be you know like darren said you question what you're reading read more and all that and it's like you know antietam doesn't just end on september 17th it's part of the maryland campaign and you have to look at that whole campaign so look at what happens after that and i mean we're not mcclellan apologist here and i 
really wish we didn't have to say that. But, um, you know, McClellan is a guy that did not sit on his ass after Antietam. He oh. immediately, you know, the night of September 17th, he's doing stuff. He has to be. He's the commanding general. He's having, you know, he's sending the army into strategic places to figure out where is Lee going and specifically to Williamsport as well. Uh -huh. So he knows what's going on. And that is something in the uh, narrative of the Maryland campaign that does not get talked about enough. And oh, yeah. yes, McClellan's a lot of things. McClellan is arrogant. He doesn't do himself any favors by some of the stuff he says. But guess what? A lot of the men um, and people of that time are the same way as McClellan. Definitely. And for some reason, um, you know, people just kind of nitpick on McClellan for that a little bit more. And that's kind that's really unfair i think uh -huh. um but i think mcclellan does really well at antietam he's working with what he has um and so is lee they're yeah. both working with armies after the battle of antietam that are very broken and they're both put in really tough spots no no and, question and it's this part of the battle is just as fascinating this you know post antietam the shepherdson battle this what has to happen is equally as fascinating as the Battle of Antietam because it factors into the historical narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of the narrative that doesn't get told enough. Definitely. But definitely go definitely go check out the battle if you go check out the town. Shepherdstown is a very cool place. Um, it's a spooky little town. Mm. If you go to a ghost court, go find my friend Elizabeth Saint. She's, I think she has ghost tours there. Um, it's, a, it's a cool little place to go. Tell her I said hello. And, um, and enjoy it. It's a great place to go. So what's coming up for us next, Mary? What's next? So next, I think, is probably going to be our Halloween episode with uh, Jay Price. Jen Price is oh, our, okay. our fourth Halloween episode, um, which we will be doing. Um, October 26th, we will be doing our next book club meeting with Lisa Samia and her Nameless and Faceless book, a poetry book as well. Yeah, so we had a lot of fun stuff. Uh, fun stuff, Coach. Maybe we can sneak in one an episode before the Halloween, if we can. We'll we probably see if we will. Can. We might sneak in a bonus we, episode. We'll try. We'll try. And but... we will try and sneak in a roundtable as well. Oh, we definitely will. So, all right. So, any final words from you, Fincheru, on this uh, this steamy, unusually warm Thursday night here in October? Um, well, I think this was a great episode. I enjoyed talking about this. Any time to, um, like I said, we're not McClellan apologists, but. Any time to give McClellan a little bit more positivity in the history field, I think is a good thing because he gets a really bad rap. Um, I mean, he's still an arrogant bastard, but he's still, um, he's a good, like, I like McClellan. That's all I'm going to say. He's, yeah. oh, he, deserves more kudos. He, he deserves more kudos than what he gets, I think. Oh, no question. All right. So everybody have a great rest of the weekend. Hopefully it's going to be nice and warm and dry where you're at. And uh, we will talk to you all soon. So Facebook Live TBD. Well, we got some shenanigans afoot this weekend. So we have no plans for have live this weekend. Maybe some night next week. We'll try to do another night one as well. So all right. So off we go. Everybody have a great rest, uh, rest of the weekend. Weekend is afoot. Tomorrow's Friday, Mary. Everybody's very excited about Friday. Hit the battlefields. Get out there. Go have a good time. And um and hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Off we go. Good night, everybody. See you later. Bye. Peace out.